So welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, an event from the African Languages, Literatures and Cultures Torch Network at Oxford. We're really happy to be welcoming you uh, in person and online this afternoon. Um, today, we will be listening to a fascinating talk by Dr. Oluwabunmi Bernard. Uh, Oluwabunmi teaches Yoruba literature and culture at Obafemi Aolo University in Nigeria where she also graduated with a PhD in the same uh, in the same disciplines. Her research interests include Yoruba literature, gender and sexuality, post-colonial and environmental studies. She's authored and co-authored papers in these areas. She also won the prestigious uh, UMAPS Fellowship at the University of Michigan and the A.G. Leventis Fellowship at SOAS um, in 2020. She's currently a visiting research fellow at the Center of African Studies, University of Cambridge. And today, Oluwa Bunmi will be presenting a paper called Sacred Trash, Paradox of Ritual Objectification in Yoruba Oracher. So you will be speaking and then we'll have time to take questions uh, from the audience. Hopefully I'll manage to take questions from the chat. Uh, or, uh, or directly if some uh, participants online want to ask questions as well. Olwa Bunni, welcome to Oxford. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. Um, it's wonderful to be here. I hope I, can you hear me? It's, yes. yes. I stay alone, so I'm more mellow now. I don't speak out. <laughs> so thank you for having me and um, well, as um, Dorothy has said, my name is Udua Bumi Bernard, and I teach Yoruba culture and literature at Obafemi Odo University. Um, let me start by thanking the AG Leventis Foundation and um, Isaac Newton Trust for giving me the opportunity to spend two terms at the Center of African Studies, University of Cambridge, as a visiting research fellow. I am also grateful to Oxford Research um, Center in the Humanities and African Languages, Literatures and Cultures Network for hosting this seminar. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Dr. Dorothy for the invitation to come and share my research with you and for facilitating my trip to Oxford. We almost didn't make it here. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, so, okay, so I'll start. Um, one of the, and let, before I start, sorry, I was going to talk about my abstract. So um, I've moved a, a little bit away from the abstract because it was, um, I had the idea in my head and I was like, let me put it out first and see how I'll work around it. So it's, um, it's um, the research has moved a little bit away from that and you hear how it has um, it's been revised and it has grown since you saw the um, abstract. So, okay, so one of, the one of the most profound arguments in my study on Yoruba sacred orature, and orature could, I mean, it's also is a, um, it's oral literature, um, and environmental sustainability is that the Yoruba traditional religion and its ritual performances and practices contain indigenous knowledge and about environmental preservation. Such knowledge, I believe, and I've argued elsewhere, can be mined to promote environmental sustainability in current times, especially with the news about Hurricane Ian in Florida and um, South Carolina and the United States and the flood disaster that has already submerged nearly 33 out of 36 states in Nigeria since September of 2022. These natural disasters have caused thousands of lives, rendered millions homeless, displaced or, in, or missing, and as of November 2022, a specific number cannot be put to what is lost in properties and investments. Also, there is no need, there is no, no, no way of knowing the disease outbreak that may follow the prolonged flooding, particularly in a developing nation like Nigeria. While looking for ways to solve, to, while looking for ways to find lasting solutions to the problem, it is also imperative to know the fast factors contributing to it. In my previous work, I have argued that African indigenous knowledge sourced from Yoruba sacred orature are replete with paradigms for understanding the nature of the problem of environmental degradation and in procuring lasting solutions. However, further ethnographic research has also shed light on Yoruba traditional religions contribution to environmental degradation 
through its ritual practices. The paper, this paper titled Sacred Trash, Paradox of, um, Paradox of Ritual Objectification in Yoruba Orature, interrogates how the ritual practices of Yoruba traditional religion, also known as the Orisha tradition, have also contributed to the degradation of the environment. Using an ethnographic lens, this paper is engaging the concepts of sacred, profanations, dirt, trash, as they pertain to ritual practices and performances of Yoruba gods. It also argues that the disposal of ritual objects and items that were once sacred or at once at, or that once contained ritual materials, objects, such as liquor bottles, bowls containing votives and so on, in the Yoruba sacred and ritual spaces and their agency play significant roles in entrenching environmental degradation. It argues that agents within and outside sacred spaces are also part of the problem. This paper demonstrates that through ind though indigenous knowledge mined from sacred origin, whom ritual performances may help in creating meaningful solutions to the current global environmental crisis, it, it, it also contributes to the problem. Example of such can be seen in many sacred groups in Yoruba communities in Nigeria. I don't know if anyone um, is um, familiar with Nigeria, but it's in West Africa, and it's um, it has um, about three major ethnic groups and about fifty-two or more languages. I mean, sorry, that I mean um, uh, um, minor groups. So we talk about Yoruba, Hausa Fulani, and Igbo as the three major groups, but we also have other minor um, groups that are in Europe, uh, that are in Nigeria, but they are always um, divided between the three major, I mean, amongst the three major groups. So the Yorubas are in the southwest of Nigeria, and currently I think they are numbered over 50 million. They are, they are also domiciled outside of um, Nigeria, in Ghana, in Benin, and in North America, in Brazil, um, Cuba, and so they are all over the place. So you might see a lot of us around because we are many. And yeah, so that's the Yoruba. And um, yes, so I was going to talk. I didn't want to spend a lot of time on that because I was. Okay. Okay. Oh, I should have moved. Okay, sorry. So this is um, what Nigeria looks like currently with the floods and all. This is parts of Nigeria. And this, um, so I was going to show that. So. I, I think I would also mention the objectives of the paper while I was speaking just then. And so, yes, so sacred, prof sacred profanations, dirt, trash, and the Yoruba culture and traditions. The concept of sacred profanations, dirt, trash have been subjected to many rigorous debates and interpretations in many, in different cultural contexts by many scholars of anthropology, social ethics, and philosophy. They have given this concept varied interpretations given the specific concerns of the social, religious, and cultural implications of their disciplines. I would explore and exploit their thoughts to define or conceptualize these terms for my limited purposes in this paper. The first question to ask, considering the title of this paper, is what is sacred? Sacred, um, according to Lad, is um, always a manifest of itself. It always, I mean, manifests itself as a reality of the wholly different order from natural realities. It also is anything human, non-human, or more than human, objects, spaces, or animals that has been set apart or aside for the gods. Agabem in his book, Profanations, put this succinctly. Sacred or religion were the things that in some way belong to the gods. And as such, they were removed from the free use and commerce of men. Any act that violated or transgressed this special unavailability, which, which reserved these things exclusively for celestial gods or for the gods of the underworld was sacrilegious. In cultures around the world, many things were considered sacred. The sacred also presents in many forms and is never a one size fits all affair. Because of the complexities of these cultures, what is sacred in one culture may be profane in another. To the Yorubas, sacred manifests in static and dynamic spaces. Seth Kunin suggests that sacred spaces 
are fluid and any space can become contextually sacred. Therefore, they, they may not be as distinctive or clearly marked as a temple or a shrine, but spots with historical, mythical, or religious experiences of the people um, are considered sacred. Uh, an Aruba, I, mean, I don't know if you've heard of an Aruba before, so they are votary mates. So if you hear me say Aruba in the context, this is, I mean, for all purposes and intents, um, it means a votary mate. But I, because of my field, I always make sure that I have Yoruba words in my paper, because then I would have um, betrayed my PhD. So, okay, so, yeah, okay, so, um, so if an, int, um, an Aruba stops intermittently to make propitiations on her way to the sacred groove, she is making that spot sacred. Most Orisha, such as Oshun, Shongo, and Oya, they are Yoruba gods and deities, have Aruba who play, who are physical representations of the gods, especially during annual traditional festivals. These festivals take place to honor the gods. The gods in return bless adherents or devotees so that they may enjoy continued loyalty and devotion. Deities only live for as long as they have devotees to revere them. Most annual traditional festivals in Yoruba communities have elaborate ritual practices to honor these gods. And most of, this, most of the contributions to the environmental degradation range from tossing away of empty water, water palm oil, um, palm wine bottles and liquor bottles as well, shootings of guns, slaughtering of animals for sacrifice and placement of votives are done during traditional festivals. The Aruba embody the gods that they are linked to and are treated as sacred. They are given the same honor as the gods that they believe to represent during the um, ritual performances leading up to traditional festivals and during the festivals throughout the period for which they serve as votary maids. So votary maids don't serve just once in your most um, to most gods. It may they, they may serve and I mean for five, I mean as long as they are um if, if a divination has been made for them, it depends on how much time they have to spend. And because they have, I mean they, they grow. So they can't they can't stay an Aruba forever because most for most cultures, especially um, for most deities, especially Oshun, a virgin girl is um um is who is um, appointed as an Aruba. And because they can't stay that way, they eventually have to grow, they get married and have families and whatever they have to do. So they have limited time. So whatever, so during the period of that, when they serve as Aruba, they are treated as um, they are given, they are called the same respect that um, dev devotees who are called the gods, who they believe that the Arubas represent. So after they have, um, okay, so I said for which they, for the period for which they serve as Aruba, after which they are rele released and assigned new roles. That means they, it was all means they are put to new uses within the court or are made to serve in other capacities as ordinary adherents or devotees they become deactivated, inoperative until the final festival season. So during um, the period of the festival, they are sacred, but immediately the festival ends, they don't have to remain as Aruba when there is no festival. So they are deactivated and then reactivated when, I mean, during the next festive season. So they have a period where, um, as Agabema said, they are profane and then they are reactivated again, they are re, after, I mean, at the next um, festival season or festive seasons. Okay, so to put objects, animals, humans, spaces to new use other than the sacred is profanation. Agabem calls profanation the, activated, the, the, the activation of the sacred. To deactivate sacred items is to make them inoperative, releasing them from the purpose for which they were primarily separated. Therefore, I argue that profanation is not necessarily the opposite of sacred. It is a transition, a temporary state. It is a passage. It is a process that may go either which way, either return to sacred or become trash. Example of profane returning to sacred are not unusual in Ifa ritual practices. So Ifa is um, one, of, I think it has to, Ifa has to be one of the most studied deity in Yoruba cosmology and um, is the god of uh, divination and wisdom. 
So ev if um, everything that has to do with the Yoruba's existence, their worldview can be found in the corpus, the literary corpus of Ifa. So is why I'm using Ifa as um, an example here. Okay, one of the most important paraphernalia of Ifa is Okmo Ifa, Ifa divination tree. And it can, be, it can move from sacred to profane, back to sacred and then profane before becoming trash. After many years of performing Ifa divination for clients with an Okmo Ifa, there may be the need to retire it due to wear or acquirement of a new one. So when um, Okmo Ifa is a paraphernalia of Ifa, of um, Ifa priests, so you would have them use one for a very long time, but they, they so when, when they are initiated into the Ifa, to the Ifa court, as early, if they were born into the family, if, to Ifa um, devotees family, they may be initiated as early as, um, as early as maybe teen, when they are teenagers, but if they are outsiders who are not necessarily family, I mean, families who worship Ifa, it may be when they are older. So, but upon initiation, they are given their own of Moifa, which is theirs. So it's, uh, it's attached to their divination date and everything is a part of them, an extension of them. So they don't just keep, they, they, they don't have, they don't naturally have to replace it every time. And because it's made from wood, it's kind of very durable. And so it stays for a long time. But then they, when it's also a status symbol for Ifa priests. So when they become, because there is, um, there is, um, there is structure in Ifa, um, Ifa religion, you have um, different chief, um, chief testy titles, different steps, and before they become the Araba, the Araba is the overall. So when they, I mean, get to these stages, they may be gifted an Okmo Ifa that um, is more artistic. It has more detailing because an Okmo Ifa may just be, a, I mean, a plate that is um, called Okmo, it's just a plate. And it may have more, I mean, engravings in it. It may be more detailed with um, artworks and the issue, the agenda, everything on the brim of the Okmo Ifa. So it's more, um, so it's, it's a form of status symbol. So if they become an Araba, for example, they may be gifted a more elaborate Okmo Ifa. When they get that, they may have to retire one that they've been using for a long time. So that was what I was trying to say that when they retire it, maybe, and if it wears out as well, if you, no matter how durable an Okmo Ifa is, after consider, if it's been used for a long time, it, it will wear out and they have to use another one. So in such a case, the Okmo Ifa will be deactivated, become inoperative, be concentrated after the necessary rites have been performed. However, if for whatever reason, an operative Okmo Ifa is not available for emergency use, a deactivated Okmo Ifa may be reactivated. Thus, the reason for the Yoruba saying, which means, with the time means we, um, if the item we have set aside to perform sacrificial rites becomes unavailable, we will use the available one. This is the same in the case of the votary meats for all Yoruba gods, as I have mentioned earlier. What I'm saying is there is that profanation is sometimes just a stage of in a, um, a state of inactivity, which does not therefore mean that the item is valueless or useless. For an item to be considered trash, it must be useless and outside an original or specific order. Is trash then the binary of sacred? So for us to think that dirt and trash mean the same thing is to fall into the misconception of both concepts. Mary Douglas, Adina Hoffman, and Peter Cole, and Kenneth Arrow, have, have different, I mean, have different definitions and interpretations of dirt and trash in different contexts. Dirt, according to Douglas, is something that is out of order. She discussed the concept broadly in her book, Purity and Danger. She describes sacred, clean, hygienic as what fits into an order, a category that human societies have created and dirt is whatever is out of that order or misplaced in it. This means that every society creates its own dirt. In describing how Douglas views dirt, Kenneth Arrow says that Douglas defined dirt as a matter out of place, a matter that conforms to a set of other relations, also as a, a contravention of that order. But even Douglas understood that no other category is absolute. The guideposts, boundaries, limits of an order may change, it may shift. 
It may move to accommodate new items or eject old ones. Thus, Douglas writes, hygiene by contrast turns out to be an excellent route, so long as we can follow it with some self-knowledge. As we know it, that is essentially, essentially disorder. There is no such thing as absolute dirt. It exists in the eye of the beholder. If we shun dirt, it is not because we, it is not because of craving fear. Still, less dread of holy ter terror. Nor do our ideas about disease account for a range of our behavior in cleaning and avoiding dirt. Dirt offends against order. Eliminating it is not a negative movement, but a positive effort to organize the environment. In Douglas's description of what is in order and what is out of order, she acknowledged that most of the things that are tagged dirty are tagged so due to our fear of diseases and even death. For example, the Yoruba of Southwest Nigeria only eats certain animals within the rat family. They eat some of the ones that are caught or killed in Igbo. Igbo is forest or bush. They do not eat the ones that are caught in Ile inside the house because they believe that such rats have crossed the line. They should, not live in, they should live in the bush and not in human houses as humans do. Same reason why some cultures do not eat pigs. They believe that pigs have organs that bear close semblance to humans. Also, many religions and culture outrightly forbid the consumption of pork because pigs grow around in more than eat their own excrement. Scientific research has also proven that pork contains bacteria and is toxic which means that Douglas' argument about the creation of order is as a means of organizing the environment is a case of self-preservation. It also, it has also religious connotation, which is why she talks about holy terror. It is also linked to cosmology and thus separation of the sacred from the dirt is also a matter of preserving the cosmological order that keeps life going, the existence of that, the existence in, I mean, the existence in order. Eliade has clearly this understanding of sacred keeping and repeating certain things to keep the cosmological order or founding order intact. Douglas talks about food mainly in regards to Leviticus 11. And even here, she is careful to state the food prohibit prohibitions were key to the cosmological order or the Jewish order of created universe. Dirty food is one of, dirty food is the one that does not properly stay within its boundary as defined by this order and transgresses it and does not cohere very well in it. Even though we may try to simplify trash, trash to mean valueless, useless and as things discarded or thrown away, it is not that simple. Trash sometimes, I mean, transcends the obvious. It goes beyond what is or what has been condemned or considered useless. Even that which is now useless was at a time useful and may become useful again in this age of environmental preservation through recycling and upcycling. This brings a new meaning to the saying, a person's trash is another, another man's I mean, treasure. Sometimes I try to not use PowerPoints, I forget them. So, so I'm going to start, with, um, so this next part is sacred sacrificial order and environmental degradation. In this paper, sacred trash are those things, objects that have been discarded after use, particularly after, I mean, ritual practices and performances. These objects that have been left, these objects have left the sacred sacrificial order Sorry, I'll take that again. These objects that have left the sacred sacrificial order are what are referred to in this paper as trash. So in this um, first picture, um, three pictures there. So this is Ifa Temple. Um, Ifa Temple is in, is in Ife. And I choose Ife because it is believed by many scholars and by the um, Yoruba people that it is the center of the universe and that it is where the morning dawns to other parts of the world. So before you see the sun in Oxford, We've seen it at Ife. Mm -hmm. So this is um this is the temple. So everyone once in a year they have this annual um Ifa festival. Once in a year it's big. Everyone comes from all over the world. And so during this festival was when I took these pictures. These were this is Siman Shinaps. So it's Shinaps. It has a bottle in there and it's um 
the liquid is used um, for libation during this festival. And when, so when the um, bottle is being brought for the ritual practices, it's still sacred. It's handled with every, with care and with respect. But once the liquid is dispensed, you get the dirt. So I call, this is what I, this is what I call trash. So when it leaves the sacred sacrificial order, it becomes trash because this is no longer useful in any way to the ritual practices. So this, these objects um, include empty bottles of shinaps or sachets, as you will see in other pictures ahead. Palm oil, palm wine, and other drinks that are acceptable for libation rites. Calabash containing decaying votives, petrifying flesh of animals, sacrificed to, sacrifice to the gods, and pieces of clothing of various colors that have been brought as offerings to the gods. I call them trash because they have left the sacred sacrificial order. They no longer serve any purpose within that space. Thus, they become trash. I argue that the improper disposal of these items after use contribute to environmental pollution and degradation in these sacred spaces and groups. Igbo Oro, um, Igbo Orisha, um, sacred groups, are some of the Yoruba names for sacred groups. Igbo Oro are large pieces of land set apart for the worship of Orisha in Yoruba communities. If it is a taboo for anyone to cut down trees, hunt animals in this Igbo Oro. In Yoruba communities, Igbo Oro, sacred groups, was a common phenomenon in the worship of Orisha. Evidences of the importance of Igbo Oro, sacred groups, is clearly stated in the Yoruba saying, Igbo ni ba shiri ebora, the, secret of the, the secrets of the gods are protected by the forest. Not all Yoruba gods have large pieces of land set apart for their worship, but most of them do. And the worships of some of these gods are more attached to sacred groups than others. One of such gods whose um, entire worship is attached to sacred groups is Egugu, the ancestor deity. Yoruba myths explain that when older relatives die, their bodies are taken to Igbo Ifeniti, the final resting place. Igbale, the group that belong to the owners of the, of the half to be laid to rest where they would become ancestors. So Egungun masquerade, ancestor deity masquerade emerges and departs into um, sacred groove. Currently, one of the most renowned among the sacred groove is Oshun groove. So this is um, Opa, Opa Romi of groove and shrine in Ileife. Also, like I said, I specifically chose Ileife for, because of the importance of the situation in Yoruba cosmology. So this is Opa, and this, um, the groove is, I mean, because of civilization and de urban development, it has um, shrunk. So it's not longer as big as it used to be. But what I was trying to show here is, see sachets of Chelsea there, the top picture there. And the, the middle picture, you see um, sachets of, we call them pure water. So water was inside of them. In Nigeria, we have water packed in sachets. So when people drink them, for libation or drink them or use them for libation after use when they discard them, then this is what happens in this. So they, this is a power of minion shrine and groove. And this um, sachet would, would have been used at the shrine for any kind of ritual practices, but after use they are discarded and they are left there. So they are not properly um, disposed. That was why I decided to show this one. And this is also from a if this is a shoe. You see what I was talking about, about the improper disposal of these um, items. So this is from Ile Ife. This, um, Eshula, this is Eshula, Eshula. Eshu is the deity of, um, is the police of the gods, as um, the devotees will say. Is the one who actually takes, um, is the intermediary between the gods and humans, and is the one who takes the votives to the gods. So you would know why it has so much um, votives in its um, So is the one who takes devotees to the God. So if a devotee has been told to, to offer sacrifice and it does not, it should is the one that goes to arrest them, basically. So this is why you have so much um, um, votives at this shrine. And you see how they are placed. These are not going away, even though most of them are organic for their food and all that, but they just don't go away. They stay there and they, 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 are, they are kind of, they are, they are pollution basically. And they, they are biodegradable, but sometimes it takes them even longer time to 
decompose. So they just stand there. And apart from that, you see sachets of sweets and all that. I was still going to talk about that ahead because as, um, as um, the world is changing, so are the items of um, sacrifice changing also. So the deities have adapted to the new, to eating sweets now. They also drink. I mean, I've seen um, libations performed with Coke. And so they're adapting really. It's, it's, it's really interesting when you witness that. So yes, one of the, so this is Oshun Groove. And OK, so this is Oshun Groove. And Oshun is, is on Oshun Go to, Oshun is in almost all the Yoruba towns. But to discuss Oshun without going to Oshobo would be really, um, it's just, it will be, it will, it will, it will be, I don't know, it will be, it will be, it will be, it will be out of order, basically, because Oshun, so origin is Oshobo. That is where she is. That's where she's situated. So I had to go to Oshun, Oshobo to do, to take these pictures. And you can see in the pictures. So that's the gate on the far left is the gate of or to the groove. And, and the second picture there, I mean, if, if you heard me talk about clothes discarded on the, in the groove. So that's um, between the branches of the tree. You see something white there. I think that, so that's, um, actually, um, it's a rugby. So it's um, a age group thing. It's a group thing. In, um, it's another cult in Yoruba um, culture. And they would do that to pacify or to, to appease the, um, the cult. So that's why they have that. And it doesn't go away. And then these are all votives, bottles containing palm oil, um, tins of uh, milk. I think Oshun takes that too. And biscuits and liquor bottles and liquor, uh, it's all there. It doesn't go away and it's all improper, just dumped at the, um, at, in the groove. And then on the far left here is the water, the Oshun River. And you can see that the water and the bottles, the empty bottles are, that have been disposed into the water. I mean, they are floating there and they are not going to go away. So this is one of the things I was talking about. And um, so Oshun Groove, okay, so it was made popular by the Austrian Nigerian artist, Susan Wenja. And in 2005, the groove was designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in an attempt and effort to protect and preserve its religious significance and wildlife. One of the most obvious signs of sacred space or place of the worship or what place of worship in Yoruba or Isha worship is the site of votives arranged systematically or scattered around a marked spot. While some of these items of offering are, called, are occasionally cleared out in some of these places, the others have become litter. They, they also contribute to environmental pollution and they pose health hazard to people. The southwest Nigeria, the south, uh, southwest region of Nigeria is classified as a rainforest. It rains for at least seven months, um, from April to October in a year. The rainforest aids agriculture of the country and also brings with it mosquitoes. The female anosphalis mosquito causes malaria, and unfortunately, malaria is one of the leading causes of maternal and infant, I mean, death in Nigeria. Some of the breeding spaces for mosquitoes are forests, unkept lungs, clogged drainage, drainages, and stagnant water trapped in gutters and containers. Sacred groups and places of worship have I mean worship contribute to this through the neglect of votive containers and improper disposal of other kinds of trash that are left behind after ritual practices. In the past, sacred groups were in the outskirts of the towns and villages far away from where people lived. But because of town extension, ex expansion due to the civilization and urban developments, sacred groups have now become closer to people's residence. As a result of this, ritual activities have, that lead to environmental degradation directly affect residents. It also affects devotees because they are also residents. When they come to the group for ritual performances, they are also susceptible to mosquito bites. The concept the contents of votives have changed over the years. Evidence from SFR show that in the past, votives were mostly organic. They were animals, fruits, foods, and other things that could easily decay and give nutrients to the environment. And I'm going to quote from SFR. Ewure meji abamu rede rede 
e yin la meji to fi wo sosuka won ni ki won fe mo to dija na kebo ru the diviners asked for an offering of two fast moving rats two fish which swam gracefully two and with two ends with big livers two goats pregnant and heavy with fetuses two ain lack house with big horns and to include the emorats that caused the quarrel in the sacrifice animal sacrifice in worship of ifa and other yoruba gods for the most part always included animals listed above i have explained the reason for that in another essay what is not noticeable is that the items are animals even though it may take time they eventually decay completely and become part of nature but in current times the contents of votives have changed they have become they have changed due to civilization migration atlantic slave trade and non availability of the original votive items the gods have um, adapted to these new changes by their devotee which encourage the continuity of jewishal worship because the power of the gods depends on the quantity and quality of the worship and attention bestowed on it by its followers that's the quote from waribuko meaning it is human beings that make a god to be great votive items also include bottles of fizzy drink sweets biscuits drinks in sachet water and pure water it is it after the contents of these um items have been dispensed at the sacred site the containers are discarded many of the containers are not biodegradable some of them wash into the rivers like in the pictures sweets and biscuit traps are blown around by winds while containers may hold water and become breeding spaces for mosquitoes it is very easy to see items that are once sacred become trash and litter sacred spaces and groves lately agents outside the groove have also contributed to pollution to the pollution this includes objects that were once okay that have also contributed to the group so okay i tied to this part of my lecture god the god and the goddess so the ritual this is um oshun um river so the two pictures on the right on the left the, the first and the second picture they are oshun groups so the first one is oshun group as it used to be before 2018 and the middle one is oshun group as it is now so the oshun river is the physical manifestation of the goddess oshun in yoruba cosmology from whom it took its name according to yoruba myth oshun is one is the only female deity among the 16 deities that descended from ono the invisible realm to aye the visible realm Her sacred groove at Oshogbo, Oshun State, Nigeria, is currently the largest of all the Yoruba gods. It is one, it is one part of that of the deity that our adherents and devotees can take with them and use, like the Pentecostals, metaphorically use part of God, and the Catholics, and the Catholics use the body of Christ in the Eucharist because I've had people talk to me like, huh, how do you how dare you compare Oshun water to this? you can i'm like okay i go to church too <laughs> so, yeah so okay so the river holds cultural significance and historical significance to oshun devotees indigents residents of oshobo and the yoruba people it contains power for healing physical illnesses diseases and invisible ones it also possesses both preventive and curative powers and because it is part of nature it keeps the land fertile and hence sustainability of healthy ecosystem in oshobo and its environs the river presents as a clear cool water the first one that runs through the entire 75 acres of forest land on which oshun grove is situated over the years votive placed by the banks and other ritual item brought to the brought to the river by devotees for propitiations have uh, continued to contribute to environmental pollution at the groove of ocean nowadays it's a common sight to see all kinds of trash floating down floating and washing down the river also piles of trash can be seen as um, close to the river for instance during my field work i listened to three yanifas so i went to on i mean i was doing a research for an entirely different project and then i was I listened in 
in, in a conversation between, I mean, amongst three women. And they were talking, they were talking, they were relating their experiences at sacred groups. And the, I think it was one of the Oshun, I mean, Oshun rivers, not this particular one, but one of them. And then they said that, um, so one of them, I wanted to read so that we, um, I don't want to, okay, so I'm trying to tell the story here. So I listened to them sharing their experiences at traditional festivals, sacred spaces, and sacred groves and sacred rivers. One of them recalled an encounter with human feces floating in the sacred river. She cannot say for certain where the floating feces originated from, but she believed it could not have been from within the sacred groove because it will amount to trashing slash polluting the sacred. Among the Yoruba, desecration intentionally or intentionally of the sacred is a taboo that is punishable. However, this concerned God see fit, with, which may be sweet or delayed for later. So the Yorubas will say, which means if you, I mean, a child, I mean, abuses the Roko tree. Roko tree is one of the, um, is, 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 I mean, sometimes in some contexts, it's also a sacred tree. And then, so when you desecrate it, and then you're like, oh, nothing happened. And so the, what I said was that, oh, it, the Roko tree may not actually do anything today. I mean, what about the future? You never know. So that's what the Yorubas will say. So, and then that's a kind of contest in which most of the Yoruba taboos are situated. You may not get retribution immediately, but you may, you will not get away from it, is what they say. So she confessed that at that time, the origin of the feces was not a primary concern, but the dirt that she had seen with her eyes. Remember I said earlier that um, Mary Douglas said that the dirt is in the eyes of the beholder. So if you have seen it with your eyes, it may, you may not be able to just ignore it. To her, the, the river, the sacred river was unclean, unhygienic, trash at that moment. The question now is, if the, the question now is, if the river is the goddess, does trashing, pollution of the river amount to trashing or pollution of the goddess? So can you pollute the, can, can the sacred be trashed? Can this trash be, yeah, can, is trash sacred? or is sacred trashed. Apart from the trash generated within the sacred group from items that were left, that have left the sacred sacrificial order. Lately, there is a much bigger problem plaguing the river. It threatens the sacredness of the groove and the preservation of the environment. The earth of the, the earth and the earth of humans, devotees and non-human, um, non-devotees alike, and also the wildlife found in and preserved by the group and the UNESCO heritage site status of the group. Since 2018, the color of the water has changed to deep brown. So that's what you have in the middle picture. The change of the color is due to the illegal mining activities for gold in Elisha. So that is one of the gold pits that, I mean, that is around Elisha. There are lots of them, but that's just one picture of them. So Elisha is in Ocean State in, is, is in, Ocean State in Nigeria the same state where um, Oshogbo is located. The lab laboratory tests and results have confirmed that the river has become heavily contaminated by mercury, lead, and cyanide because of gold mining. As a result, the river is not just polluted, it is also toxic and deadly to anyone or anything that comes in contact with it. But it would interest you to know that even though the adherents are aware of the toxic state of river ocean. They hold a strong belief that the power of the river is still potent. While some of them would perform their propitiation without coming in contact with the river, a great number of them would use the water for ritual practices the same way they have done before it became polluted. While, this, while, the, sacred is not, while the sacred has now become trash to some, the majority still treat it as sacred. So I ask sacred trash. Okay. So in conclusion, in this study, I made an attempt to theorize sacred, sacred profanations, death and trash in the Yoruba um, culture and tradition and how it relates to their perception of the environment. The, um, the environment and its preservation are now important, are very important to the Yoruba people to, because the gods manifest as part of the nature as landscapes, as meteorological phenomena. So to revere the nature environment is to revere the gods. 
However, what is sacred can consciously or unconsciously become desecrated as discussed in the, course, in the cases of these sacred spaces by agents from within and without, thereby making, the sacred, making trash the sacred, trashed sacred. Thank you very much. I, Thank you very much for the work with me. Mm -hmm. uh, I will take some questions now. Sorry, I will stop sh uh, um, sharing the screen to check if there are questions online as well. Really Sorry? Really yes, okay. we did. We still are actually. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, let me just check the Q&A here. Um, well, we have a first question for you. Yeah, I feel like it's someone you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> fair enough. No. We can start with that while uh, the audience in the room ponders for questions. So the first question is uh, from Anthony Bernard. Uh, As urban development has made sacred groves closer to residential areas, can they, the sacred groves, be moved farther into the thick forests? Do you want to answer that? And then we'll be taking more questions. OK, thank you. Sure. OK, thank you. Well, like I said, that, that was from Mr. Bernard. So, yeah. <laughs> I did not, well, thank you for joining. I didn't know you joined. <laughs> okay, so um, well, um, I, I, like I said, or I have said during the course of the paper, um, urbanization does, I mean, has um, reduced the size of forests and um, it's not easy to just move the sacred groups because every part of, um, that was one of the things that I think it was um, um, Kenneth that said that, I mean, I, no, it's Eliade that said that, um, Sacred is um is a part of um it's it it could be spots that people attach mythical historical relevance to. So when they say this place is um, sacred to us, they can't just move the sacred because it has a it, it has a deep they have a deep connection to that spot. So when the um forests shrink, it's not easy. That's why you saw or um or forest I mean growth shrunk. So they just made it, um, maybe I think what's left now is just where the Opal Romanian is. So whatever they can, they can't just move the Opal Romanian to another spot because that is the exact place that Romanian, who is now, that was, I mean, he, he, he planted the um, uh, obelisk there and ascended into Orum. So moving that would be moving, yeah, it, it will mess the sacredness of that spot. It will mess it completely up. So the only thing we can do is reserve this remaining one and not encroach more into the, um, I mean, the sacred groups, but we can't just move the sacred elsewhere, and the sacred group elsewhere because they are, I mean, where they are occupying is very, very significant to, significant to their existence as, um, um, yeah, so that's why we can't just move. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Uh, are there, let me just close this, yeah. Can I just, okay, that's fine. Um, sorry, are there questions from, okay, three questions from the room. Uh, okay, what about we go that direction? So Dylan, Tanashe, then, I'm oh, sorry, I don't know your name. Emma. And then Emma. Uh, so if you can ask your questions in turn and then maybe you can answer the three of them. Okay. Is that okay, you'll take notes? Yes, I'm Perfect, good. okay, not good. Um, so as a follow up to that previous question, you talked about like different objects and spaces being able to move between the sacred and the mm. If there is an incursion of pollution into established sites which have been made sacred to represent certain deities, then does that mean that potentially new sites which are less affected by pollution could come to acquire a sacred meaning and almost create new sacred sites which retain their elements of perhaps not being included, have been spaces that could occupy a sacred function? Okay. They moved, like moved by the pollution of existing spaces. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Do I take all the I questions? mean, it's kind of up to you if you prefer okay, to answer I, each question. Okay, I can. Use. Okay, I can answer. Okay, so um, for thank you for that question. So you, I showed. I think the last slide I had was Oshun River. See. Okay. So um, I had I have other pictures of um the groove. Um, it's um it runs through the entire seventy five um, acres of the the whole length of um the forest and all that but um it doesn't it, there's a reason why they hold i mean the if i may mean, have a bigger picture where you see the shrine and everything and where they think that they, the goddess of herself appears every year during the festivals 
And so move it, I mean, moving the river, the, and unfortunately for in the, in the case of Oshun, the, the river is not, the pollution is not just at that spot. Mm -hmm. So it started way of, this, this Oshobo is far, is about um, 20, I don't know, kilometers from Elisha, maybe more, I don't know. But then I live in Ife, Ile Ife. And from Elisha to Ile Ife, to Oshobo, the water is polluted all the way. So the water that runs, that runs in my university is also that color. So where do you move? The forest too in Osho, I mean in Oshogbo that is not or in Osho State that this because it's at the end of the day it's still the same water, I mean the same river that runs through the entire city. So if you move it, it if you're moving it down, nothing is going to happen. So you have to move it before the um, gold mines, and that may be outside of Osho State, and then Osho is Oshogbo, I mean Oshogbo is Osho. So moving outside of the state would just be moving out of the entire terrain that is, and it is more, apart from that, in the myth of creation, Oshu it was said to have um, come out from the river. There is a spot there where they say she has come out of. So moving that from there to where it's not polluted, it's, um, I think it's not the solution. The solution probably would just be make them stop um, disposing, I mean, make them stop with the illegal gold mining or find better ways of, um, this, I mean, disposing, I mean, or getting rid of the water that they use for gold mining, but to move, I think it's capitalist, it will, wherever they move to, capitalism will find them. Mm -hmm. they, there's no running away from it. It's just to maybe tackle the problem at, this, at, the, I mean, at, the, at the beginning of it, where it starts, mm -hmm. at the start, not run away from it because there's no running away from it. It's there, it's there, it's going to run through the entire. So that's why I said using that, and because we fear, and also another part of the question is, so if it is just forest, because Oshu is a river goddess, so she has a river. There are some that have goddesses. I mean, there are forests, sorry. And there are trees there. There are animals there that are preserved. So people fear, people fear going into that forest. When I was growing up, when we hear Igbo, we are scared of it. We think people go there and they don't come back. You know, the stories and all that. And so people don't cut trees. They don't hunt for animals. They don't um, farm in there. And then, of course, it has reduced, but still, the little space they have, people are a little bit still scared because it's a taboo to, to use those um, areas for commerce. So people are still a little bit scared. So if you move it out, people will be like, oh, okay, so it's not, it's not really a big deal. Then we can go in there and just use the remaining resources left in there. So keeping those um, um, sites where they are um, in their current and original positions are some of the things that have been helping preserve the environment within those areas. It was one of my arguments in the publication I already had. So thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the fascinating paper. Thank um, you. I was curious when you talked about the, the deities adapting. So like people bringing coal or sweet and mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. And it, it made me wonder, what is sacred? Is it the observation of the rituals uh, considering that the things that people bring uh, change depending on on the times. So I'm curious about yeah, what what's what's what the sacred references to? Is it the is it pointing towards the ritual of of participating and communing with the god with the deities and the gods, or it is bringing these things? Okay, um, well, ritual. Um, there are stages to ritual. So we have the part where um, votives are involved. And you also have the ritual practices, the ritual performances, which may not necessarily include, um, it could be oral, it could be just having a relationship with the deities and the, the gods and as it were. But um, remember, I mean, I think it's asked, I mean, I, I, there is this um, saying that man met God and they both shouted, my creator. <laughs> okay. I've, I've seen it, I've, I tried to locate who the um, original author was, but I keep finding anonymous or Chinese or Nigerian or people just concord <laughs> all kinds of sources for them. But then I, when I saw that, I was like, hmm, man made God, okay? So um, we, we, I mean, a lot of scholars have argued that religion, the, ex the continuous existence of religion is because of the devotees, okay? So if people don't do it, it's not going to exist. A lot of cultures have performed day, day, day side. They kill their gods. 
because they don't um, they feel they are too demanding or they are becoming too angry. They just kill them off. It's in the Calabari culture. And um, there's the, the I mean you may you may, you may have heard of the Shokono in Yoruba culture when it was becoming too angry. They killed it. So if um, a god is it does not want to adapt to the changing environment of his deity of a devotees, it's likely to die. Or they will, if it dies, well, that's good for the deity, but they may kill it because then they, they don't have what um, to appease or what to, um, to worship it with. So I think it's okay for I me. Mean, and then you have to consider, I also mentioned that Yoruba religion is not only domiciled in Nigeria. So for Ogun, palm wine is used for worship. But if you go to Brazil, do you have palm wine there? So you use what is available within your environment. So if you go to another country where there is um, no palm wine, you have to you still have to worship Ogun, but you can improvise and adapt. Ogun understands because at the end of the day, Ogun takes whatever you give to it because you are the one actually, I mean, allowing it to live. So that is why, and because of the changes, and like I said, the, when something that is needed is not available, the available, becomes what is useful. So because I, when I witnessed the coke um, libation, it was accidental. So I was sitting, I was waiting for my um, respondent, I was waiting for my respondent and it was just, um, so I, and then this, if I priest came quickly, wanted to um, perform a ritual, I mean, do a ritual performance and he couldn't find any liquor available. And he had a coke bottle with him, unopened. It was, it was, um, it was a, a fresh one and he opened it and I was like, what is going on? And he performed the libation there and then because that was what he, he improvised. So what was profane became sacred for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's adaptability. If we always have to wait till what is available, what is um, original becomes available, then a lot of things will not, we will not be able to do a lot of things. So people improvise. I mean, in our daily lives, we improvise. So why can't you improvise with worship? Okay, so we, I mean, Christians, it, they, they no, I mean, they don't, when we do the Eucharist, the Eucharist, mean, yeah, it's the Eucharist, my mom, I hope she's not watching, she's <laughs> okay, So um, the Eucharist is the, is the shine of bread, yes? And so no one has the original bread. The one Jesus um, shared with his disciple. So we just, we improvise. So we use the unleavened bread, we use this one bread, we use that one, whatever. In my, I mean, we have, we, we use yeast bread. In Nigeria, I was at the church when my priest could not find, there was not enough bread. And it, it got this um, just, normal, just normal bread. And we ate and we were fine. It wasn't bad. So I'm saying that it's the same for everything. So when what is, need, what is original is not available, what is available, a profane may become sacred for that purpose. So that was why I said, that, in, that was arguing in my paper that, when you want to draw a line between what is profane and what is sacred, then sometimes it's just not that easy. It could be a stage, it could be a transition, it could be a temporary state. Something is in and then it moves, but it could move um, to sacred or to trash. So um, I think they are just trying to improvise to, to, I mean, to allow for longevity for the deity, otherwise it will die. I hope I... Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, yeah, thank you. Um, I was wondering whether uh, what the response of the, the if of the priests have been to the pollution and what the priests do the priests see it as kind of uh, just part of the worship and, and some of it is just going to happen um, or do they view it as pollution and also if there are communities or kind of community response to any possibility of like cleaning or how people feel about that. Okay, thank you. Well, um to I think one of the things that um maybe contributed to the pollution. It's um, attitudes to um, environmental preservation, so and to dirt basically, and to how we dispose dirt. So where I come from, um, 
um, and I have pictures of um, that as well. So um, in the ocean roof, because of the improper disposal of waste, people, I mean, so I think they improvised and started putting um, waste baskets at strategic places. And you will see people dump things beside the waste basket. It's there, it's there, just put it in there. But they dump things beside the waste basket, not in the waste basket, see? And even though it's a, it's a sacred site, they know Oshun may be angry for that. But we, the attitude of disposing things properly is not really ingrained into us. We just like, if, it's, if I'm done with it, I can dispose of it. So if, when I ask the, um, the priest, so what do you think about this? Um, I was like, oh, so we just, we, we try to dispose them properly as much as we can, but because we have thousands of people coming to the groove every time or every festive season, it's very, very hard to keep, to keep, make people do the proper things. So, um, so what, and I asked, so what does Oshun feel about this improper, um, or what does the far feel about this improper um, disposal? Then one of my um, respondents said, if, or, or, um, if, um, if, if I would um, be angry at that, we would all be dead. <laughs> See, if, if I would be angry with that, at every improper, I mean, improper disposal, we'd all be dead. But then there are all kinds of disposal too. So there are ones that if I would be angry at, and there are ones that if I were allowed to pass. So if you are, if you, I mean, the ones you saw the bottles, the, um, the cartons of um, bottles of the synapse that I showed you, that is um, something that anyone could pick up and dispose properly. But if you, if it, it, that's, I mean, it's different from a human waste. So if you went to the group, um, to the sacred group and pee, or you went to the sacred group and passed excrement, then if I would not let that go, because that is a deliberate, it could be unintentional because sometimes you are pressed and you're in the bush, <laughs> but you still can't go. You're not supposed to, it happens. People, I mean, you, you, it happens, but you, you must still not go in the sacred. You have to find elsewhere to do your business. Mm -hmm. So there are some, um, waste dispos um, disposal, I mean, ways of disposing trash that if I'm allowed to go, but there are some others that if I would not, no matter what, let go according to what they believe. And so, and there are other ways of annoying the gods as anyways, but just physically disrespecting them by pulling in the sacred groove would be a way to just um, really, really infuriate them. So that I, I got from my respondents and all that. And so I think it's just um, in two ways. So there are some that if, if I was going to, or, or she was going to be angry at every disposal, everyone will be dead. But also there is also the part that where you have to know exactly what you are disposing improperly. You can't pass human phases in the group. It's not going to happen. But then we, I asked about the Oshun situation. So how does Oshun feel about um, this gold? Because it's um, you in, in the, in the, in the, Oral literatures, but I mean, in Oshun's oral literature, you will find out that she is also a god of a goddess of gold. So, which is one of the reasons why gold is found in um, um, Oshun State, and it's not just in Elisha; it's all over Oshun State. So, and then you'll be like, okay, so you gave them gold. Now they are messing it up. What are you going to do? I think they don't. They, they don't. They don't have a definite answer for me. They just believe that the water still has um, its spiritual potency. And but you have to always still be very very careful of how you interact, um, how you co come in contact with the water because of the health um, hazard that it poses as well. So it's it's a bit um in the middle of um, angry or not, I and mean, we don't know. But it's still a work in progress. So I thank you. I'm I'm curious as to whether or not priests and others that you've spoken with have, have um, indicated any sort of a, a sense of an encroachment of, or an alienation from offerings and such. The, the plastic bottle being made far away from the individual who's at the, shrine, at the, at the temple, the, the Coca-Cola being bottled in, I don't know, somewhere else in Nigeria or somewhere else in the world. Um, and the distance between the person and the thing, and then the, the mass production of that, creating a, a lasting ramification that can harm even these places, harm, harm the, the, the woods. 
to kill the trees themselves, um, have they reflected on, on, on sort of the encroachment of, of, of capitalism, sure, but, but different, different gifts being given today than, than in the past and what that might entail for the, the ability to continue? Well, thank you. I'll try to see if I, um, yeah, if I, I'm trying to just understand the question well. Well, I think that, um, um, as I've maybe said in, maybe I don't, I'm not sure it was this one or the one out, but um, the Yoruba um, gods have, um, they, they, and the devotees, they have a relationship that is, um, it's, it's there and it changes. It's adaptive. So they both need each other or one another, as it were, because you will not have, find a single, um, we have similarities, a lot of it. And, but so do these, um, how do these, they, they, I mean, devotees feel about these um, wastes or how they have been disposed? Well, like, I think I've said this also just then that um, when I was coming with Dorothy, I said, is it going to be African time? No, is it going to be the British time? Or, and she was like, oh, we have the British, I'm like, we have Nigeria, we have the African time. So African time is, um, yeah, it's, it's um, yeah. So, <laughs> so it's there. And so you have this African, this, this attitude to waste disposal as well. So we have this, um, it's, it's, we, we, they've not really come into terms it's how much damage or how much of destruction is happening to the forest or to the groove, to the sacred site because of these waste disposals. So in, if you go to the Oshun group, I, I, I hope, I, I don't know how to sort PowerPoints a lot. This was one of my best, I've never, <laughs> ever done, I don't do it. I just give it to someone to help me. But I have pictures of um, the, an, the animals in the Oshun group. So you have the, the, I think they call it the Columbus monkey. And you have these antelopes also. And you have trees that I have never, I mean, I have pictures. They are so, they are so old. And um, you, which is very, very strange because People don't, I mean, I have people carving trees out of mango trees now. So trees are very, very scarce. They are rare commodities, but you find trees very old. You have oak trees, you have thick, you have massive big trees and very old in the, in the groove because people still are still scared of the deity. One, two, because of course, there's also the law. UNESCO and the government are working together to make sure if you get into the grooves, you are going to get in trouble. But most importantly, they don't kill the animals. You find them working, they don't even respect us when we pass by. You know, they're so used to you. The way I see squirrels there, and I'm like, huh, they're chasing me off the path. Mm -hmm. So my, our monkeys at the group also come at you. They, they, they are that they are comfortable they are. There are so many and they don't get killed because people respect them and they are extension of the deity in the group. But um, they are also going to be drinking from that water and it's mm -hmm. going to kill them. Mm -hmm. And there are no more fishes in the water. Even though people don't fish in it from the river, they don't. They can't because it's you are fishing the deity, so they don't. But there are no more fishes because that is toxic for them. That has killed them. And I'm sure fishes are big, so we, we see them. There are other kinds of wildlife in the water, in the river that we can't see, that are dead because of this pollution. It hasn't really done on the devotees the amount of damage this disposal or this um, gold problem is causing to the groove. And to humans, it may not show off on humans now because during the last festival in April at Oshun Oshobo, you still find devotees washing, doing the ritual, washing of face, washing of body. And I'm like, hey, but it's not going to kill them now or it's not going to start affecting them now. But what about the future? Mm -hmm. So we haven't come to terms with how much this environmental degradation is just like the wrath of the deity. It doesn't come swiftly. Okay, it takes time. Mm -hmm. It's mellow, but it will eventually come. It will happen. And if people wash faces, people get a full body dip in the water as well. And people take waters to the house. I have pictures of it. It was br as brown as it was, and they will take them in white bottles so you will see the color of the water. And they know that this is not the usual. This, is, this was not how the water looked, but they don't care because they, are, they have so much faith in the deity that she will protect them. But they are not also trying to help protect the deity herself because according to what I've said, the sacred has become trash. The, 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 they are trashing the sacred as well. So it's more than just, um, it's killing the religion as well because when people start dying, they may think the deity is um, becoming angry and they may choose to kill the deity and not the cause of the problem. Mm -hmm. So we have still not come to, into terms with how much problem this um, 
improper waste disposal and um, this um, gold thing is going to be in the, I mean, in the course of the future of the religion. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but I hope we, we will sort it before someone dies. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was wondering if um, we could also try to sort of revert perspectives and because we've talked about the sort of how the believers react to it and the priests. And so I was wondering as well, if there are some groups or individuals that are primarily motivated by environmental concerns and preoccupations. And if they have tried to channel spiritual or religious discourse to uh, raise awareness about the protection of the environment. So not coming from the place of either the believers or the priests, but rather from you know other groups or individuals that that might want to preserve the environment for the sake of the environment, basically, but find a way to sort of channel these concerns within a larger spiritual discourse to try, you know, to try for it to resonate. With, uh, with people in the community. Yes, I, I was trying to look for the name of this movement. So there's this hashtag on Facebook. I think hashtag Save Oshun River or something. And then there's also this group, uh, Urban Space or something here on Facebook. And they are, they've been, they've written letters. I mean, organized symposiums, workshops to educate people, gone into villages and towns to tell people, um, I mean, documents of um, the letters they've I mean, written to the government, I have um, copies of them. And yes, people, a lot of people are trying to, who are not even related, to, I mean, who have nothing to do with the religion, but they are just trying to raise awareness about how much, um, about environmental degradation and about the effects, its effect on human health. But I think um, capitalism is the devil. And yeah, so it's it's people don't, um, a lot of people are making money from the legal mining. And so even the, I mean, the residents of these communities where the gold, they used to have clean water, they don't have any. And when people go there and try to tell them, oh, stop, let, stop letting them mine your gold. They attack the people coming to help them. So I think they don't understand how much they think it's, um, I mean, maybe they drink from, um, one of my friends would say that, um, when these things happen, when this thing happens eventually, it's going to affect everyone. It's Yoruba saying, or only book in I mean, the world is going to end. Oh, we are going to all be affected. It's not going to end in one side of the world. It's going to end everywhere. So it's still the same thing. If you are in, if you are, Lagos State is far from Ocean State. So people in Lagos are like, oh, it's not my business. I'm like, it's our business because we have one of the, I mean, Ocean State has a brewing, fa beer brewing factory mm -hmm. that serves the whole nation. Mm -hmm. Basically, so wherever you are in Nigeria, if you drink beer, oh, you're drinking from ocean water, basically. And then you'll be like, oh, I don't drink beer, thank God. Oh, well, you don't, but you use palm oil. And they make palm oil in ocean states. They're going to use the water. So you're going to get in trouble. Oh, well, I don't eat palm oil, good for you. Do you eat beef? You do? Oh, there are cows drinking from that water. So no matter what you, no matter, you can't disassociate your, yourself from this problem. It's coming from everybody. And I mean, my children, I'm like, hey, we, we, I see water in my house is clean, but then I have to buy other things that I don't make in my own house. So it doesn't matter where you are. As long as you are in Nigeria, you're going to get into, you matter what, no matter where you are, you probably will come into contact with the water. And if you see it, it's easier for you than to even drink it, right? You don't even know what is, I mean, what is missed in what you're drinking. So yes, people have written, people have, um, done workshops, symposiums, organized, I mean, went into the town, done performances to educate people to tell them about the dangers of these um, problems. But um, no one is really doing anything. And we are even scared, I mean, we are scared that or, I mean, UNESCO may really take away the um, water heritage site status of the group based on that. So it's, it's um, and when that happens, okay. So the animals may be in trouble and those trees, may also be maybe 75, 75 acres of them. They also may be susceptible to felling and to farming to, yes, it's going to be really, really disastrous when that happens. So we hope that people will listen eventually, but we'll keep trying. Thank you. I think there might be another question in the Q&A. Um, and it might be the same person that somebody raised their hand. Okay, so let's... 
There's another question uh, by Sikiru Abiona Yusuf, uh, still on profane. Um, what is the place of deities that specific libations are prohibited? How do you reconcile lack of actual libation during commemoration? I might need to read that again. Um, still in profane, what is the place of deities that specific libations are prohibited? And how do you reconcile lack of actual libation during commemoration? Oh my God. Okay. Um, I'll leave it on. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so, um, well, the place I don't, I like I said, deities don't have, um, some of them have specific um, libation, I mean, in, I mean um, liquids that they, like, they prefer for libation. So like I said, I mean, Ogun is um, drinks palm wine. So for people in Southwest Nigeria, where there are palm trees, it's easy to tap the wine from the tree and then libate. But if you have, um, but what if there, I mean, what if palm wine is not available and they needed to do a ritual performance or a ritual, uh, they do need to do something. They have to improvise. So I don't think that the deities are bent or hell bent on a specific or an item specifically for um, their ritual practices. I don't think so. I think whatever they, even the original ones were, they were created or they were made by humans. Okay, so this is what we will give Ogun. We'll give him palm wine because according to our myth, he will drink palm wine, yes. So we give him palm wine. But in a lot of places there are less and, I mean, less and less of palm trees. So you have people not having enough palm wine to even drink, not talk of to give to um, the um, to Ogun. So in those cases, or where there is none, during the dry, I mean, dry season, there may be not enough um, palm wine around and people improvise. So I don't, and yes, there is, so when it's, um, I mean, if it was, when it was bought, it's profane because it was, it was for the commercial use. Okay, but immediately they start to ruminate on making it, they start to ruminate on making it sacred and they don't just buy and then libate a deity. No, they go through a lot of rites. They go through a lot of incantation, a lot of, um, it's a practice. It's, it's, a, it's, it's not just from the market to the shrine. No, it's not from the market to the God, no. It takes a lot of processes before it gets there. So they are making it into sacred. And then, then it, it, it leaves, that was what I was saying about the profane and the sacred. So it, leaves, it comes from profane, becomes sacred because it didn't start off as sacred. So it comes from profane into to sacred. And then after that, it's the, what I'm concerned about is not what happens to the palm wine after, no. What happens to the container? What was the, what the palm wine was brought in? Because the palm wine can easily be going to, back into the half if it's poured on the ground. But what happens to the container that the palm wine comes in when it's discarded? That's when I say, okay, so it has left the sacrificial order and it has and the sacred sacrificial order. It has become trash. Basically, that was why I didn't say sacred profane. I said sacred trash. Because it, to me, profane is still a, it's a process that I think may go either ways. So that, I, I don't know if I, um, so if it is, so if a natural libation or a natural libation is not available, then you use what is available. That's what I, I've said this many times during the course of this um, presentation that when what is needed or what is original is not available, you make use with what is available. So if, it, if palm wine is not available and you have um, water, you can use it. If you have water and you needed, um, um, if you needed um, 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 liquor, could be shinaps, and you don't have, and you have coke, like the Ifa priest did, I was there. You can use it. So it's not necessarily exactly what you need, but what is available can also become sacred for the use at that time. That was what I was saying. I hope I was able to answer this question because I struggled a bit with that. So thank you, thank you. Um, I, it's, it's, a, it's a small thing, but uh, yesterday, I mean, I'll, I'll try to find it and send it to you, but actually yesterday on Twitter, there was a, there was a video about a group of um, Nigerian priests in the Parisian Museum, the Kemoni, and they were deactivating uh, a drum uh, that okay. had probably been taken without, you know, uh, the proper rites being performed. And so it happened yesterday. Uh, it was yes. It's really interesting. So yeah, uh, yes, it happened. Yes, yeah, so that's what I was just trying to say. So it's, it's a, and then because it's been deactivated, does not mean that it cannot be reactivated. 
So if they need to use it, they can reactivate yeah. it. So that happens with Okmo Ifa. I've seen, I mean, I've seen people have Okmo Ifa at the back of their car that has been deactivated and then they have a need for it and then they reactivate it <laughs> and then they use it. So it doesn't necessarily mean, but once they throw it out, what's inside the garbage, then it's trash. But because it has been deactivated, it's profane. It can, at that, at that time that it has been deactivated, it can be used for, to play Ludo. I don't know if you play Ludo here. <laughs> it can be used for a lot of things and the gods will not be angry. But once it's reactivated, then it cannot be used to play Ludo anymore mm. until it has been deactivated. Then, that, then it becomes inoperative. Mm. Then after that, if it goes into the trash, then that is the end of it. Mm. And that may not necessarily be with recycling and everything, and upcycling. Someone might find it and decide to make it into a coffee table. So it's also part of the environmental preservation we're talking about, but I'm saying that sacred, I mean, profane may not necessarily be the binary opposite of sacred. It could be just a passing phase, mm -hmm. or yes, that's what I'm saying. It could be just a, a, I mean, a temporary state for a ritual object, human, non-human, more than human. It could be just a temporary state and then it can move either ways. But when it becomes trash, then it has left this, the original sacred sacrificial order, which was what I was trying to say. I hope it's making sense. It's, yes. it's there. I mean, I've, I've been arguing. It's, I mean, I, I'm hoping it's going to be the last chapter of my book. And I've been arguing, I've published even that um, if the Yoruba um, orator, sacred orator, um, has always encouraged and continue to enforce to a large extent environmental preservation. But then I've been arguing, and then I went to Leeds, and someone asked me this question. I think it was in April. I was at Leeds, and I had presentations there. And someone asked, oh, you, you're telling me that they don't do anything. There are no trash in it. I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> I'll check, and I will revert. So this was my, um, this, was, this is supposed to be my answer to that question. Like, OK, so they, all, they preserve the environment, but the practices also kind of pollute the environment as well. So it's kind of um, a contradiction mm -hmm. to the old book. <laughs> I don't know, I'm going to pull it off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, you so yeah. much. Is there uh, one last question? Are we good? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, if we haven't finished our this up, this should be recorded, uh, so. and uh, hopefully we'll be able to post it on one of the web pages of uh, our Coach Network uh, um, websites. So thank you again thank so you. much for thank visiting you so us. Much. Thank you for and, having uh, Good luck with uh, finishing your book, I guess, yes. then. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank You're you. very welcome. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, thank you to the people who attended online as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.